Hi everybody, Mary O'Keefe here from the European Pain Federation EFIC. Today I'm joined by Ricard Vixel to give you a teaser of his talk at the 2022 EFIC Congress. So Ricard, thanks for taking time out of your date to agree to be interviewed. Would you, Thank you, Mary. Would you like to start by introducing yourself, please? Sure. Um, um, I'm a clinical researcher and a psychologist. I've been working with um, essentially developing treatments for pediatric and adult um, chronic pain patients for the past 20 years. Uh, past five years, I've been moving more and more into working with digital interventions. Uh, I have a position as a research group leader in, um, at KI um, in Stockholm, where I'm an associate professor, and I'm also the head of research at the pain clinic at uh, Capio St. Joran Hospital in Stockholm, where we try to build uh, an infrastructure for clinical research uh, and to a large extent utilizing digital um, tools and digital interventions. Great. And what will you be talking about at the EFIC Congress next year? Well, I'm going to talk about how we can um, essentially utilize digital interventions to improve um, the quality of care for chronic pain patients. Um, and um, my focus will be on uh, the development, the testing and the implementation of a digital behavioral intervention. I will use our Dahlia project as a core case, and, and I will discuss um, things like uh, how we can use um, single case experimental design in a series of optimization studies and how that actually may be preferable to uh, the more traditional uh, randomized controlled trial when it comes to development of digital interventions. I will also talk about what we mean by an agile development, which is a word that's been used in, in, in this area for a while. Um, I will touch upon some implementation barriers um, um, because ultimately, what we do is essentially about um, providing uh, the best treatment possible or the best support possible for people that try to uh, live an active and meaningful life with chronic pain. Okay. The first point, actually, you mentioned there that randomized control trials might not be the optimal method to look at digital interventions. Could you explain a bit more on that? Because I think that's an interesting point. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, I think we're all trained um, to think that randomized controlled trials are the golden standard, um, but we also know about the shortcomings. Um, there's um, normally a range of problems with that type of design. Um, we have uh, exclusion criteria that makes the results that we get from the studies less uh, generalizable. Um, the, so the external validity may not be ideal or the ecological validity. Um, also, it takes a long time um, and, and a lot of money um, to, to uh, produce the results from a randomized controlled trials. And there are options. But I would say that what we, what we need at the end of the day is not just information at a group level. We need to understand what works for one specific individual. So um, the individual variation in treatment effects is sometimes neglected in the, the more traditional type of research. And, and ironically, um, that is exactly what we need to know in healthcare. So I think utilizing those traditional um, designs actually increase the, the gap between uh, research and clinical practice. So it's a bit of a paradox actually. And single case experimental design uh, is something that has been around for quite some time, but been developed, um, particularly the statistical methods um, the, the past decade. So I think this is a very, very important um, um, approach for uh, providing the type of knowledge that we need to develop our interventions. Because we all know we, it's not just about like developing new treatments, it's about matching the treatment with the specific need of that individual. And that requires that we understand the mechanisms of action in treatments. And a SCED approach um, will probably do a better job than an RCT in that regard. But it's not a competition between the two. Uh, we, of course, we need both, but we need them for different purposes. So I think that um, in the development phase, um, when we have, when, when the job is to develop a new intervention or a new format, I think we need something that is smoother, faster, that can provide, uh, you know, results with high internal validity, but also that can be used to move forward 
Um, and that's why we are talking about the series of optimization studies rather than one big uh, randomized control trial, for example. Yep. And within the studies you're going to be discussing at the Congress, so the optimization type studies, what digital services are you most interested in or focusing on? Well, I'm interested in many types of digital services, um, to be honest, but in this project, we are utilizing um, um, a web platform that is being um, used in Sweden, and it's um, it's essentially implemented to be used in all the different regions, so it's accessible, which is important. And I will touch upon procurement as an implementation barrier. Um, and in Sweden, we have this condition where we can actually use this platform. So we are, uh, we are looking at how we can support individuals in effectively manage chronic pain. So um, I think that even if, for example, video meetings, and um, uh, which is also a digital intervention, uh, is, is very useful. I think what we also need to do is to, pro to provide tools uh, so that people can um, become more um, autonomous in their um, ability to manage chronic pain on a daily basis. Yeah. So um, it's, it's kind of a self-help tool, but with an additional features that provide opportunities for communication, you know, on a, on a, uh, in a safe system, of course. Um, but this is just one way of using uh, digital tools for communication. Of course, we're also super interested in how we can tailor interventions and maybe um, not just tailor it in the sense of matching it with specific needs and known before treatment starts, but also modify the intervention based on how the, the, the patient responds to the treatment uh, through, throughout the treatment. So for example, machine learning algorithms could be potentially very, very useful, um, but to this date, it's not, very common that you see AI or uh, machine learning solutions that have a true clinical utility in the field of, of behavioral interventions, for example. That's where we're going, but there's a long way to go to get there. So at this point, we're looking at something that has like a, a high uh, practical clinical utility, and that would be a support system for self-management. And within the support system at the moment you say that you want to ideally it would help clinicians modify treatment is the communication currently at a high level between the patient and the web platform to allow that to happen well that's 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 the aspiration but we are i i would unfortunately say we're far from it at this point of what we're doing uh, to start with is to look at you know, the more simple work, like how can we put the information on a web platform and make it accessible to the individual? How can we break it up into what we sometimes talk about as micro sessions so that, you know, the, the individual can um, have uh, like a, um, a frequent interaction with the system. Um, you know, traditionally, we, we used to see patients like one hour a week in, in the, you know, standard psychotherapy format. But, you know, given the, uh, the objective to modify behavior patterns in everyday life, we uh, ideally would like to have a more frequent interaction between the therapist and the patient or the digital system and the patient. So um, we need to improve uh, um, the communication and that can be synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, and we can, we can utilize different tools for different purposes to, to maximize the, um, the communication quality and quantity. Um, but then we also need to collect data from the individuals that, that are undergoing treatment. And the digital tools um, has changed the landscape um, dramatically for not just healthcare, but also for research, because we have now uh, a better um, opportunity to collect the type of data that we can then analyze rapidly and, and hopefully use that data in what I would call data-driven decision processes. And, and that can be used in so many different ways. So what I hope for is that my talk is seen as a description of a core case that has scalability. Like we can, we, we will talk about core issues or key issues in the development, testing and implementation, but it can be done in many, many areas. For example, 
uh, it's quite common that uh, we prescribe medication without really knowing if it's going to work. So we, we really need to test the effects of the pharmacological intervention, and we need to do that properly. So bridging the gap between science and clinical practice can be done with a digital tool where we have a baseline phase, for example, and a digital tool where the individual is providing relevant data on, you know, let's say, uh, pain intensity. And then we move into a treatment phase. Um, and then you can look at how, you know, the fluctuations, uh, you can do it uh, in real time. And then you can have an interaction where you talk to the patient about the data they just provided. So you can invite the patient to be part of the decision process. Uh, so we can actually have a more open, transparent communication with the patient, which will likely enhance patient engagement, treatment compliance, and these things that we know are so important for, for the quality of care, but also for the treatment effects. And we can get some data to support us in navigating these different clinical processes, the difficult clinical processes. For example, uh, deciding on if we should continue uh, um, a treatment, if we should change it, or if we should actually stop. So these things can be done in a better way if we have data and data we can get with the digital tools. So it's not just about the communication in the sense of providing treatment. It's also communication in the sense of um, getting data that can be used for, for many different reasons, including both research and clinical practice. This seems a very radical shift from traditional face-to-face -face care that patients might be used to. Do we have any data at the moment on how acceptable this type of approach would be to patients? I think that that question is really interesting, uh, given that we are like in the hopefully the the, the end phase of a pandemic. Uh, two years ago, we would think we would have thought differently about this, um, and we we are all living with these assumptions that you know that we've heard it all of us like older people, they struggle with digital tools. I'm not so sure about that. Actually, data says something else. So when it comes to how, how we feel about using the digital tools, of course, we can improve um, uh, a lot of things to make it easier. But in general, I think we're actually quite okay with it. So um, both in terms of the technical challenges, like, and of course, the threshold can be lowered by people, you know, uh, developing the systems to increase um, 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 feasibility and, and um, acceptability of the system itself, but also how we feel about the communication and the relationships that we have that are not necessarily a physical meeting, but a digital meeting. So I at, at this point, I think we kind of agree, uh, most of us, that it's actually a pretty good mode of, of communication uh, to, to sit and, and talk to someone and also to chat with someone or um, even uh, in, in the terms of like um, asynchronous communication. And data also support that. There are our CBT um, uh, studies, cognitive behavior therapy studies or meta-analysis showing that the type of, the digital type of interventions actually sometimes work as good as a more like standard face-to-face -face intervention. And uh, data from a lot of feasibility studies show that the people that are undergoing these type of interventions, they, they, they like it. Um, but what we do not know at this point is um, we assume, uh, but we don't have any empirical data to support that there are specific subgroups that struggle more with digital interventions than other subgroups. So we need to learn more about the digital landscape and uh, who likes it and who struggles with it so that we can modify, because we want, we want to reach everyone. We can take over the responsibility for the behavior change and, and the life um, choices, but we can provide a, an, an intervention uh, in a way that maximizes the chances that the, that individual can use it to make something great out of his or her life. So I think at this point, we are like moving to, towards like very exciting times where we can like integrate the digital tools and the digital systems in our communication with the patients. And that goes for both research and clinical purposes. So um, 
I mean, I'm very optimistic about it, but we certainly need to know, to, to know, to know more and to adapt uh, to this uh, digital landscape. And that opens up also for other professions because um, it's about, ultimately it's about communication. So it's not just uh, uh, the physician or the psychologist or the psychotherapist, it's, it's a team of people that can provide these services, you know, ranging from the, from the tech whiz to, um, you know, the, the, the person responsible for communication. Um, so, and, and, you know, all the health professions in between. So I think that is kind of interesting that we're in this new landscape more than ever, we can conclude like in order to provide the best type of care we can possibly provide, it takes a village. Yes. And if we step back from what patients might think, do you think this would be an acceptable model to clinicians or do you think they'd be worried that they'd have to change yeah. their yeah. training and practice or what do you think so far? I mean, they do have to change the practice. They do have to change the training. So, so that's not just uh, an empty threat. Like that's the fact we need to, we need to modify, we need to adapt, but that's like evolutionary. That's always been the case. And if we are not like um, up for that challenge, well, then we are in, in, in a problem. But I think that we as a community within healthcare, research, academia, teaching, like I think that we, we will have, you know, a transition, of course, but uh, we will, you know, we will make this work. Um, and the people that are uh, super excited about this, well, they might be early adopters, sure. Um, but certainly uh, the conditions have changed and they will continue to change and we need to adapt. For example, there's um, not many opportunities for training when it comes to providing digital behavioral interventions. And that's very different from providing, um, you know, psychotherapy in the more traditional formats. Um, and I, I can probably come up with many other uh, examples as well, but being a psychologist, this is what I see um, very clearly. So of course we need to provide training in digital uh, psychotherapy. And I would actually argue, I'm not sure that we should even think about it as psychotherapy. It's ultimately about behavioral change and it's ultimately about communication and communication is much wider. It's not just, you know, the synchronous communication, it's the asynchronous communication, providing information, giving a patient time to work on this and then come back and, and everything around that. So yeah, it might be, it might be scary for clinicians and, and you know, decision makers, but I, there's no going back. So you're really enthusiastic about it, but at the same time, you mentioned implementation barriers. You said you'd be talking about that at the Congress, yeah. like uh, procurement, you said, as an example. Is there a few key implementation barriers other than procurement that you'd, that you, you'd focus on, do you think? Um, we've touched upon them already, I think. Um, if, we, if we have the, the best, um, and the most efficient treatment uh, on, on the planet, but people, they can't make it work uh, for different reasons. Uh, for example, they drop out. Um, the people that continue treatment, they are, they're going, you know, has high, high speed um, towards, you know, a, a wonderful life, but very few people make it through the treatment. Well, then we have a problem. So we, we need to work on the feasibility aspect and the, um, and the user friendliness of the intervention. So that is something that is an implementation barrier. Um, and we also need to do a better job of understanding the subgroups or the individual differences because it's not, it's not gonna be one size fits all. We know that. So what about people with um, dyslexia or you know, cognitive challenges? And you know, what about people that struggle with um, you know, financial constraints, they don't even have a smartphone. So there are so many different things that we need to work on that actually at the end of the day need, needs to be considered an implementation barrier. So again, it takes a village. It's not just about developing the perfect intervention. It's also about providing it in a format that maximizes the possibility for 
all uh, patients and all and all people that need it to actually be able to access it. So accessibility is a complex question. Um, also, it, you know, the, as I mentioned procurement, um, but it's about the whole um, the whole uh, infrastructure, the whole financial infrastructure. Like we're now looking at a challenge where you know we have potentially new systems new tools and it could be that we also have new uh, companies or, or organizations involved in providing healthcare that hasn't been you know doing this before or at least has not been part of that um, financial system um, of healthcare so and it's it's a very traditional world in some ways so it's going to take a while for um, at least um, in, in Sweden, we have like most of the health care is, is, you know, tax funded, like it's, and, and it's, it's a slow system. So it's, it's used like the traditional format of that system uh, is actually making it difficult to make rapid changes in the infrastructure. So even if we will have uh, great digital solutions that can be used in healthcare, it's not a given that they will be uh, used in healthcare um, quickly. So, and it has to do with a lot of different things, of course, but um, when, when we talk about the implementation barriers, it ranges from the individual and, uh, and the, for example, the onboarding phase, the technical challenge for the individual to the societal infrastructure and how we use tax money and the decision processes uh, related to that, so everything in between. So I will touch upon a few things, for example, procurement, um, because that is something that is very clearly of relevance when we do things in academia, or we could do it in, in collaboration with uh, industry partners. But if we develop something uh, in, in, you know, a scientific community, um, it's it's not obvious that we can just put that into work in um, in the healthcare system. So for 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 us to be able to use it in regular healthcare, uh, a lot of different things are needed, including procurement. So um, I think again, what I've said before, it takes a village. We need a much better collaboration between healthcare partners. Uh, researchers and partners in academia, and also the industry. So that is something that I will touch upon in my talk as well. Great. So digital is here to stay, but we need to change the barriers and make it more personalized to the individual. It sounds like that. Yes, certainly. The landscape has changed, but the questions are the same. Yep. Uh, people are suffering from chronic pain and they're struggling with managing their lives. And our job as researchers and our job as healthcare um, uh, professionals is to provide the best treatment possible or the best self-management system possible to help these people uh, live an active and meaningful life. So one final sell for your talk, why do you think people should attend your talk? You've outlined lots of reasons, but if you had to put it into one or two sentences. Well, if you... <sighs> If you feel um, excited about the, the opportunities that um, are provided by this new digital landscape, uh, I think you should join the conversation. And uh, maybe you can get inspired uh, during the talk and we can have a chat about uh, your thoughts and my thoughts um, and continue the discussion and potentially uh, create a collaboration that will be part of this um, strategy that we all share, because again, it takes a village. That's a good way to, to end. Uh, that's great. So thanks, Ricard. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you, seeing you in Ireland. Um, so for those listening, if you want to join us at the next EFIC Congress in Dublin, Ireland in April 2022, the good news is tickets are now available and you can get them on the website www.efic-congress.org. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Mary.